looking for Kerlin as usual to try to get that inside shot. They lob it into him, right side of the key, he spins, hook shot is good! All right, it's taken out by Parker. Parker throws a long one into the left side, they beat it into Silk, and it's tapped away from Silk! And we win! 54 to 53, North Carolina did it! No team ever was as disciplined on the basketball court as Al McGuire's clubs at Marquette University. Left of life, goes back to Michael Jordan, jumper from out on the left, good! The Star Eels are going to win the national championship! On a crisp afternoon in early December of 1891, Dr. James Naismith invented basketball. There were no breakaway rims or 24-second clocks. Instead, this 30-year-old physical education teacher at the YMCA training school in Springfield, Massachusetts, had created a simple game. He attached peach baskets to the railings of the balcony at the opposite ends of the gym. He had also scribbled down 13 rules, including Nine players to a side, baskets counted for a single point, and a jump ball after every basket. The new game of basketball was a success from the second the first ball was tossed up into the air. Word quickly spread that something new was going on in Springfield as spectators flocked to see Naismith's creation. Said Dr. Naismith of his game, and I quote, I had in mind a tall, graceful, and expert athlete, one who could reach, jump, act quickly, and easily, unquote. If one didn't know better, it would almost seem as if Naismith was describing the players of today. Measured in national championships, no school in the history of college basketball can approach the success of UCLA. Between 1964 and 1975, the Bruins were unstoppable, winning 335, losing 22, and bringing home an amazing 10 national titles. Behind this greatest dynasty in college basketball stood one remarkable man. His name, John Robert Wooden, the Wizard of Westwood. Coach John Wooden was so good that in my run to the Roses, in 10 years of my career, we used to fight for the second best. And the reason I like Coach Wooden is that he won nine championships in the NCAA. That way, instead of disliking nine guys, I only disliked one guy. His records will be there forever. Nobody is ever going to match him. And uh, he was a great coach great gentleman, and boy, what a credit he was to the game of basketball. John Wooden first grabbed the attention of the basketball world as a three-time All-American guard at Purdue University in the early 1930s. Under the guidance of head coach Ward Piggy Lambert, the tough, aggressive Wooden was instrumental in leading the Boilermakers to the 1934 National Championship. Fourteen years after this accomplishment, 
John Wooden accepted the head coaching position at UCLA and set about the task of turning Westwood into a winner. In 1964, behind the backcourt combination of Walt Hazard and Gail Goodrich, the Bruins defeated Duke by 15 points in the NCAA Finals to cap an undefeated season and earn the school's first championship. With no starter taller than six feet five inches, the 64 Bruins utilized a devastating full court press along with a dynamic team chemistry. They complemented each other very well in the different things that they could do. Uh, Goodrich is a great shooter, Hazard's a great passer. Uh, Hazard had to be fired up to some, I, I had to be at times critical of him to get him mad at me. If I'd get Goodrich mad at him, he'd go in a shell. Well, you learn that about their different personalities. Uh, Erickson was a highly spirited competitor, uh, but a great athlete. Jack Hirsch was a, I, I can't, uh, no one can analyze Jack Hirsch. Uh, the group complemented each other ex exceptionally well. Returning only two starters from the 64 team, Gail Goodrich and Keith Erickson, the Bruins repeated as national champs in 1965. In the finals against the University of Michigan, Goodrich played one of the greatest games in Final Four history, burning the Wolverines for 42 points in a 91-80 UCLA victory. In the winter of 1964, the whole country was talking about Lou Alcindor, a seven-foot-tall New York schoolboy. Alcindor, now known as Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, was such a force at Power Memorial High School that NBA coach Gene Shu said of the 17-year-old phenom, I'll trade two first-round draft choices for him right now. After more than 100 college scholarship offers, Lou settled on UCLA. That fall in Westwood, Alcindor's freshman team with Lucius Allen, Lynn Shackelford, and Kenny Heights previewed the future in an intra-squad scrimmage against the varsity. We played them the first, our first game of the year was the uh, varsity freshman game, and uh, they're ranked number one in the country, and uh, we beat them by 15 points. And um, so they ended up that they were ranked number one in the country and number two on campus. People uh, would ask about it and said, well, what do you think about the freshmen actually beating them in the inter-squad game? And I said, oh, well, it's tremendous. <laughs> It, uh, it just has me looking ahead with, uh, with great pleasure. It made the future look mighty bright, I'll tell you. Bright indeed. Beginning in 1966, with Alcindor in the middle, the Bruins would win 88 games and lose only two in the next three years. When the curtain finally closed on the Alcindor era, UCLA had become the first school in the history of college basketball to collect three consecutive national championships. After Alcindor's graduation in 1969, UCLA was expected to return to the ranks of mere mortals. Much to the dismay of the competition, this was not the case. With the front court of Curtis Rowe, John Vallelee, Steve Patterson, and Sidney Wicks, the Bruins won 57 games in the next two years and added two more national titles to their trophy case. Following the graduation of Wicks in 1971, the stage became set for a new era at UCLA and a superstar center named Bill Walton. At six feet 11 and extremely mobile, Bill Walton was everything Coach Wooden expected in a big man. He didn't have any weaknesses as a player. He was a great all-round player, a great attitude, uh, uh, worked hard uh, on the floor at all times, uh, set a great example as far as uh, uh, workability. Uh, in, in many ways, he marched to the, uh, to the beat of a different drummer. With teammates Keith Wilkes, Greg Lee, Larry Farmer, and Tommy Curtis, the Walton Gang was invincible, going two and a half years 
and 88 consecutive games without losing. In the 1973 NCAA Final against Memphis State, Bill Walton played the greatest offensive game in Final Four history, scoring 44 points and hitting on 21 of 22 field goal attempts. Following the graduation of Wilkes and Walton, nobody expected UCLA to be national contenders in 1975. Yet behind the leadership of David Myers and the talents of Richard Washington and Marcus Johnson, the Bruins made their ninth consecutive Final Four appearance. Before the Final Four began, John Wooden announced he would be retiring at the end of the tournament, regardless of the outcome. In order for UCLA to give their great coach one last championship, they first had to get by a tough Denny Crum coached Louisville team. With seconds remaining in overtime, the Bruins trailed by one. A Carter against Murphy to Spillane with eight seconds. Around to the right to Marcus. Richard Washington shoots from eight. He scores! Four seconds, three seconds. Having survived the Cardinals, UCLA faced Kentucky to decide the national championship. The game was close throughout, but the Bruins started to pull away late in the second half. Finally, with less than a minute remaining, it became obvious that John Wooden, the Wizard of Westwood, would retire with one more championship ring. Swift, and high in the air. The Bruins players go jumping all over each other. It is one of those fantastic moments in sports history when UCLA's John Wooden in his final coaching game at UCLA. Fully recognize the legacy of John Wooden and UCLA basketball, anything less than a 10th national championship would have seemed inappropriate. When reviewing the basketball career of Ray Meyer, it's important to mention he did not invent the sport. It only seems as if he's been around as long as the game. As a player at Notre Dame in the late 1930s to becoming head coach at DePaul in 1942, his association with basketball has spanned six decades. In all, four coaches, Adolph Rupp, Fogg Allen, Henry Iba, and Ed Diddle have more victories than the coach who recorded 724. In his 42 years as head coach, Ray Meyer had 37 winning seasons. He produced 20 teams that earned postseason tournament bids, including 13 trips to the NCAA tournament and seven trips to the NIT. One of his most memorable seasons occurred in 1979 when his Blue Demons made an all-out drive to reach the Final Four. Standing in the way were the UCLA Bruins. Brigham Young had their dancing girls on the floor going through their routines and the uh, UCLA players came out on the floor a little early and they started to play the UCLA victory march and they ruined the dancing routine. So the people in Brigham Young, they didn't like it. They were upset. But when we came out, they cheered for us like we were mad. We, they adopted us. After the ball game, we came back to Chicago. We had, we, we had the following week to play in the Final Four. Well, the president of Brigham Young called our president and asked, said, no, she didn't have a band. Would you mind if our band represented you? So they did. And we sent them uh, little T-shirts and hats, and Brigham Young uh, band represented DePaul in Salt Lake City. That's the first time the Mormons and Catholics ever got together. Though DePaul made it to the Final Four, the Blue Demons lost to Larry Bird in Indiana State in the semifinals. However, Coach Meyer characteristically looked on the positive side. He was, after all, doing what he loved best, coaching basketball. I look at basketball and saying this, boy, what a wonderful life I have led because I got paid for doing something I like to do. The year was 1955. The team was the University of San Francisco. 
The players were a six foot one inch guard named Casey Jones and a skinny six foot nine center named Bill Russell. The result, one of college basketball's greatest dynasties. Under the watchful eye of coach Phil Wolpert, the Dons launched college basketball into a new age. But Russell made shot blocking an art. He is the only one ever, even to this day, that has shot blocking as an art. We played him once, and I told, him, uh, I told our center, if you don't fake before you shoot it, it's never going to get up to the rim. Well, he took his first shot, and Russell didn't block it. He caught it. <laughs> we got, and then he watched one of our players. He looked like a little ant. He let him go around underneath the basket, and let him go up, and then he took the ball. He, he was just so good. Bill Russell knew how to intimidate more than he knew how to block shots. And he, he, he put that pink elephant in the back of your mind. So every time you'd go in, if he would block five shots a game, he would intimidate 30 shots. In 1955, San Francisco was unstoppable as they took a 27 and one record into the NCAA finals against third rank LaSalle and their superstar, Tom Gola. With Russell and Jones combining for 47 points, the Dons cruised to a 77-63 national championship. The winning streak continued to 54 straight games next season as USF once again reached the NCAA Finals. This time, Russell and company defeated Iowa 83-71 for their second title and claimed the winner's share of $12,500 from the NCAA. Russell, Jones, and the University of San Francisco Dons one of college basketball's greatest dynasties. Beginning in 1931 and lasting for more than four decades, one man, Adolph the Baron Rupp, ruled the sidelines of Lexington, Kentucky. While collecting more victories than any coach in history, 874, Adolph Rupp made the University of Kentucky synonymous with college basketball success. In basketball craze Kentucky during the 30s and 40s, everyone followed Coach Rupp and the Wildcats on the radio. My brother and I used to sit at home and listen to the Kentucky games on radio when we were little kids. And uh, we would play along with the cats with a coffee can and a wadded up piece of paper and, and shoot back and forth into each other's can as as the game progressed. Rupp's Wildcats were a disciplined, fast-breaking outfit that received plenty of national attention. In fact, all state players from across the country would travel to Lexington to try out for the team. The competition was intense, and many quality players didn't survive the cuts. Many of the players that were cut by Coach Rupp were picked up by other schools as they left the gym. and. Uh, courted by the, especially the colleges locally. But uh, there were, I remember many good players that did not receive scholarships that tried out here. And uh, one in particular was Frank Selby. And Frank went to Furman and became the nation's leading scorer. From such a deep talent pool, Rupp put together college basketball's first superstar team in 1948. They were called the Fabulous Five and featured All-Americans Ralph Beard, Alex Groza, and Wallace Wawa Jones. In a three-year span, the Fabulous Five won 100 games, lost but seven, and won two national championships. Unfortunately, the accomplishments of the Fabulous Five were permanently tarnished when Beard and Groza were indicted in the point-shaving scandals of 1951. That team was so loved throughout the state that the reaction was disbelief that uh, this just could not have happened to our players. And I remember Coach Rupp's statement before the scandals hit Kentucky was that no one could touch our players with a 10-foot pole. Despite the involvement of his star players, Rupp kept on winning at Kentucky. In 1951, he collected his third national championship behind the towering talents of seven-foot-tall William Spivey. Seven years later, the Baron picked up his unprecedented fourth national title when the Wildcats defeated an Elgin Baylor-led Seattle squad 84-72. to In 1972, Adolph Rupp retired from coaching. 
After 42 seasons, the incomparable Barron's influence extended far beyond the Kentucky bluegrass. He was known throughout the world as uh, the greatest coach, the uh, winningest coach in collegiate basketball. Uh, he was the king and he was the chief and, and he was the potentate and because it wasn't the bluegrass, why well, he became the baron of the bluegrass. Nineteen fifty seven saw the emergence of Wilt Norman Chamberlain, the seven foot two sophomore center from Kansas. Nicknamed the Big Dipper, Chamberlain averaged just under thirty points per game as he led the once beaten Jayhawks into the NCAA Finals against top ranked North Carolina. Tar Heel coach Frank McGuire had a multi talented team with six foot five hotshot Lenny Rosenbluth, Joe Quick, Bob Cunningham, Pete Brennan, and Tommy Kern. The Tar Heels entered the NCAA title game with a 31 and zero record. Their dream season almost came to an end in the semifinals as they survived a triple overtime marathon against Michigan State. Just about everybody felt North Carolina was too tired to bounce back, especially since they now had to face the agile young giant from Kansas in the final. However, Carolina triple team Chamberlain and paced by the streak shooting of Rosenbluth, they led 29-22 at intermission. In the second half, Wilt finally broke free from the zone as Kansas looked to make a move for the title. To make matters worse for North Carolina, Rosenbluth fouled out with a minute 45 to play and Kansas leading by two. Only a late basket by Tar Heel senior Bob Young, his only points in the game by the way, sent the contest into overtime at 46 apiece. The first overtime ended at 48 all. The second overtime went scoreless. Finally, in the third overtime, Carolina's Joe Quick calmly made two free throws to put the Tar Heels up 54 to 53. All right, it's taken out by Parker. Parker throws a long one into the left side. They feed it into Silk, and it's tapped away from Silk, and we win! 54 to 53, North Carolina did it! Incredibly, North Carolina had won its second straight triple overtime game. The Tar Heels finished their perfect season as one of the greatest teams in the history of college basketball. They call him the Big O, and no one had ever seen a player quite like Oscar Robertson. In the late 1950s, the six foot five Cincinnati sensation ruled the game of college basketball. Inch for inch, pound for pound, could be the best player. Every time he stepped on the court, he came to clinic. That meant if you watched him out there, it would be like going to a basketball clinic and spending eight hours learning how to coach and learning how to play. What looked like an accident was not an accident. Everything that Oscar Robertson did was on purpose. He's the one high school player that I thought could have immediately stepped right into the pros, skipped college, and been a star. Not just, not just going into the pros and been an ordinary player, uh, he could have been, in my opinion, a star immediately. Indeed, Oscar Robinson was no ordinary player. At Cincinnati, Oscar became the first person ever to collect three consecutive Player of the Year awards. He concluded his brilliant career averaging more than 33 points and 15 rebounds per game. Amazingly, though, he was a better passer than scorer and rebounder. If they counted the assists as they do now, if they count them that way in his time, they'd never break his records. The Big O led the Bearcats to consecutive Final Four appearances in 1959 and 60. Unfortunately for Oscar, he never had a chance to play for a national championship. Both years, the Bearcats were eliminated by California in the semifinals. Nonetheless, Oscar Robertson provided college basketball with a new standard of individual excellence and forever secured his place in the history of the game.
Ohio State basketball coach Fred Taylor was a happy man in 1960. The reason? His sophomore class featured the talent of six foot eight inch center Jerry Lucas, defensive ace John Havlicek, and highly touted Mel Knoll. Along with shooting star Larry Siegfried and veteran Joe Roberts, the Buckeyes became one of the greatest shooting teams in college basketball history. Among the substitutes on this team was another flash of brilliance, a fiery line drive shooting player named Bobby Knight. Bobby Knight was a very tenacious player. He's known for defense. Bobby Knight tried to play defense as hard as anyone else. He didn't have the quickness of other people. And when you played against Bobby Knight, you knew you were going to be in a physical battle because he didn't have the quickness. Therefore, he would grab you, he would hold you, he would bump you, he'd move you around. And you knew when you were fouled. All-American center Jerry Lucas led the country in field goal percentage for three straight years as he made over 62% of his shots. The Buckeyes cruised to a 25 and three record in 1960, easily defeating California in the finals 75 to 55. They would, however, suffer two straight championship losses to Cincinnati in 1961 and 62. The bragging rights issue in Ohio was settled by Cincinnati's powerful six foot nine center, Paul Hogue, as the Bearcats won back-to-back -back national titles. Ohio State fans, however, will long remember their battling Buckeyes, a squad that made it to the NCAA championship game three straight years and sent four of its players on to the NBA. They called him Pistol Pete. College basketball had never seen a scoring machine like Pete Maravich. Playing for his father, Press, at Louisiana State University from 1968 through 70, the Pistol completed his amazing career as college basketball's most prolific scorer. With his floppy socks and dazzling ball handling, Pete Maravich put pizzazz into the game of basketball. with a great amount of ability, natural athletic ability. Pete could do a lot of amazing things with the basketball. Uh, he was really a showman. I mean, Pete would go out there, to, you know, put on, to put on a show. I mean, that, that, that's what he wanted to do. That's how he looked at himself as a showman. Pete loved the game. You know, he loved the game. Uh, and he was a lovely person. I mean, a lot of people didn't know Pete, but there's nothing Pete wouldn't do for, for you. Individually, if you asked him in terms of helping you any way you can, financially, in terms of basketball, clinics, or whatever uh, necessary, he would do this. And uh, I just thought he was a great talent. In only three years at LSU, he rewrote all the record books. Most points in a season, most points in a career, highest career scoring average at 44.2 points per game, and most points in a single game, 69. Whether it was from behind the back or through the legs, double pump or one-handed, the result was the same. Pistol Pete Maravich, college basketball's greatest showman. On January 20th, 1968, over 52,000 people filled the Astrodome in Houston, Texas to watch what was billed as the game of the century. Number one UCLA and center Lou Alcindor faced number two Houston and All-American Alvin Hayes. This dramatic setting was enhanced even more by the fact that the court was so far removed from the fans. It was a great spectacle. UCLA's 47 game winning streak pitted against Houston's 48 straight wins at home. A serious concern for Bruin fans was that Alcindor had injured his eye the week before in a game against California.
still bothered by vision problems, Lou elected to play anyway. However, from the opening tip, it was clear that the evening belonged to Elvin Hayes and the Houston Cougars. Comes up with a steal. The Cougars on the attack. Chaney setting up Lee. That's Hayes, 17-footer. Houston Lee, 2-0. The Big E rarely missed, hitting 17 out of 29 shots from the field and finished with 39 points. Hayes in the corner. Houston Lee. In the end, Hayes' two free throws clinched the win for Houston as the Astrodome went wild. The final score, Cougars 71, Bruins 69. In the early 1970s, the only team talented enough to end the UCLA Bruins' seven-year reign over college basketball was the 1973-74 North Carolina State Wolfpack. A unique collection of individual talents, Coach Norm Sloan's team featured three key players of very different style. The 74 national champs were built around the big man, seven foot four inch Tom Burleson. Big Tom was a dominant presence inside with his rebounding, scoring, and shot blocking. On the wing, superstar forward David Thompson a three-time All-American and Player of the Year in 1974. Thompson gave the Wolfpack unstoppable offense with his 42-inch vertical leap and a soft shooting touch. Orchestrating this high-powered offense was the diminutive Monty Tao, standing only five feet, six inches tall. Tao's floor leadership, hustle, and clutch shooting made him arguably the most important member of the super team. In 1974, North Carolina State finished the season as the number one ranked team in the country. In the national semifinals, the Wolfpack faced UCLA for the second time that year. The game was hotly contested throughout and went to double overtime. In the second overtime, the Bruins watched an early seven-point lead slip away as North Carolina State stopped their 38-game tournament winning streak, 80 to 77. In the finals, behind David Thompson's 21 points, the Pack defeated Marquette 76 to 64 to earn their first national championship and secure a place as one of the greatest teams in the history of college basketball. The game of college basketball has seen some classic matchups over the years. Alcindor Hayes, Walton Burlinson. In 1979, two more superstars met head-to-head. -head. Irvin Magic Johnson of Michigan State and Larry Bird of Indiana State. Simply stated, college basketball took a quantum leap forward for the emergence of these two stars. Never before had the game seen a six-foot, nine-inch guard who could control a game quite like Magic. I said it, and I'll say it again, that in my whole basketball career, I've only seen eight or ten very special players, and he's one of those eight or ten. Uh, he combines uh, not only a, a wonderful gift, but an incredible amount of tenacity and uh, desire to win. He pushes other people. He's just a great leader. As for Larry Bird, the skeptics claim he couldn't run, jump, or succeed against quality competition. Well, the skeptics were wrong. Bird finished his career as the ninth leading scorer in college basketball history, averaging over 30 points per game. The long-awaited shootout became reality as Magic Spartans and Bird's undefeated Sycamores met in the 1979 final. 
When the smoke cleared, Magic Johnson's 24 points carried Michigan State to the national title. However, the big winner this evening were the millions of basketball fans across the country who witnessed the emergence of two of the game's greatest players. And basketball had its first glimpse of the Bird Magic era. College basketball. For 100 years, it has produced many magical moments. Players who changed the game, coaches who were innovators, teams that performed miracles. Today, basketball is at the height of its popularity. With the NCAA fielding a 64-team men's tournament and the women's game reaching new levels of excellence. From Dr. Naismith's peach basket dream through a century of spectacular athletic achievement, the glory of the game continues. 